Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be here. It's good to be here to lead you in worship and to bring God's word. But before we do that, uh, why don't we come before our God and ask him to bless us this evening. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, on this beautiful summer evening, we have gathered together as your people to worship you and to confess our absolute and utter need for you and your grace and your mercy toward us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we are so grateful that you are the God who loved us first, that you are the God who called us out of darkness and transferred us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into your marvelous light so that we could proclaim your excellencies. And we're grateful that we've had opportunity to do that already in song. Uh, We pray that we would have more opportunity to do that in this coming week. And Father, we pray that you would help us to do that, that you would continue to equip us, uh, that you would continue to give us understanding into your word. And so we pray that you would bless us this evening, especially as we open your word, because in and of ourselves, we confess that we are unable to understand it. In and of ourselves, we are unable to put it into practice. And so we pray that your spirit would be present, that your spirit would be present in the preaching, but also in the hearing, and that our hearts would be shaped and molded to look more like Jesus Christ, and that we would go from here with all that we need to tell the world about Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, sinners that we are. And so we pray that Jesus would be made big, and that we would be small. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, So this evening, of course, is a teaching service, and I wasn't given any sort of prescriptions on what to teach on, so I just figured I would teach on whatever I've sort of been teaching on on my own in my church in Redemption. So the last couple of weeks, I've been working through ecclesiology. Uh, That's just a fancy word for the doctrine of the church. Um especially as it ties into one of our confessions. So as a Church of the Reformation here too, uh, we confess that Scripture alone is our ultimate authority, the authority by which everything else is normed and brought into line, but we have confessions, uh, confessions to help us navigate through the Scriptures and to isolate key doctrines and help us to understand them. Uh, And so this evening we're going to be looking together at the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. So first, Lord's Day 21, where we uh, look at the one line in the Apostles' Creed, uh, what do you believe uh, concerning the Holy Catholic Christian Church, or I believe a Holy Catholic Christian Church. Uh, We're not going to recite this this evening because there's a lot to cover here in confessional reading. Uh, So you can follow along. I'm just going to read it at at a fairly brisk clip. Question 54 of Lord's Day 21 says, what are you concerned, believing the Holy Catholic Christian Church? The answer is, I believe that the Son of God, out of the whole human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, defends, and preserves for himself, by his spirit and word and the unity of the true faith, a church chosen to everlasting life. And I believe that I am and forever shall remain a living member of it. Question 55, what do you understand by the communion of the saints? First, that believers, all and everyone, as members of Christ, have communion with him and share in all his treasures and gifts. Second, that everyone is duty-bound to use his gifts readily and cheerfully for the benefit and well-being of the other members. Uh, Question 56, what do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? Uh, Answer, I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, nor my sinful nature against which I have to struggle all my life, but will graciously grant me the righteousness of Christ that I may never come into condemnation. Now we turn our attention to the Belgian Confession. Uh, If there are any students here who just finished a school year at Guido de Bret High School, uh, Guido de Bret is the guy who wrote the Belgian Confession, uh, and he dies really for it. Uh, He's he's hanged uh, for his profession of the Reformed faith. Uh, And he's articulating, he's directing this document primarily to a Roman Catholic monarch, uh, trying to assure this Catholic monarch that Protestants aren't nut jobs, they're not crazy, Uh, they are Christians and they hold to the Orthodox faith handed down from the apostles. And here, uh, in some ways, it's, it's a shot across the bow of the Roman Catholic Church. 
Uh, but here he confesses what Scripture says, and it's our confession too uh, as, a, as a church in the Canadian Reformed Federation. We believe and profess one Catholic or universal church. So those two words mean the same thing, which is a holy congregation and assembly of the true Christian believers who expect their entire salvation in Jesus Christ, are washed by his blood, and are sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This church has existed from the beginning of the world and will be to the end, for Christ is an eternal king who cannot be without subjects. This holy church is preserved by God against the fury of the whole world, although for a while it may look very small and as extinct in the eyes of man. And thus, during the perilous reign of Ahab, the Lord kept for himself 7,000 persons who had not bowed their knees to Baal. Moreover, this holy church is not confined or limited to one particular place or to certain persons, but is spread and dispersed throughout the entire world. Yet, it is joined and united with heart and will in one and the same spirit by the power of faith. Article 28 uh, is everyone's duty to join the church. And it says there, we believe since this holy assembly and congregation is the assembly of the redeemed, and there is no salvation outside of it that no one ought to withdraw from it, content to be by himself or herself, no matter what his status or standing may be. But all and everyone are obliged to join it and unite with it, maintaining the unity of the church. They must submit themselves to its instruction and discipline, bend their necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ, and serve the edification of the brothers and sisters." according to the talents which God has given them as members of the same body. To observe this more effectively, it is the duty of all believers, according to the word of God, to separate from those who do not belong to the church and to join this assembly wherever God has established it. They should do so even though the rulers and edicts of princes were against it and death or physical punishment might follow. And so ends our confessional reading. Let's turn now to the word of God. Our first scripture reading is taken from the Old Testament, the book of First Kings, uh, First Kings chapter 19. This may or may not be a familiar passage to you. If it isn't, at the very least, it is a compelling story. Uh, I would encourage you to read the context on your own later if you are not familiar with it. Uh, the King James Version speaks uh, differently. Um, what we're going to read about as a, as a whisper, uh, this, the, the King James vo uh, Version calls it a still small voice still small voice. So maybe you've heard that before. Uh, verse 9, then he, this is Elijah, went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to the death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from abel Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. And now to the New Testament, uh, the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 14. The Apostle Paul asks, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. 
Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Well, someone once said to me, uh, or I've heard someone say this, and maybe you've heard something similar, uh, the church is only one generation away from extinction. Have you ever heard that line? I see a couple of heads nodding. The church is one generation away from extinction. I wonder, I wonder what you think of that statement. Do you agree with it? Uh, do you disagree with it? Do you think it's a biblical sentiment that the church is one generation away from extinction? It's a rather precarious situation, isn't it, if that's true? At a human level, it's a compelling statement, isn't it? It's one that hopefully makes us sit up in our seats and take stock of who we are as a church and what we're doing as a church and whether or not we're stewarding the gospel that's been entrusted to us by the saints who have gone before us. Absolutely, we should sit up and think about those things. Will there be a church tomorrow? Maybe this has kept you up at night as a parent or as a grandparent, thinking about the future and your children and your grandchildren, will they continue walking with the Lord? Will there be a church in Canada in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Will cultural pressures uh, or persecution finally wipe the church out? Now, church history, whether it's distant or or recent, is filled with tragic examples of once faithful churches falling away because really one generation compromised on the purity of the doctrine, of the gospel itself. And without the gospel, in the span of one generation, two generations, those same churches become virtually extinct, or at the very least, indistinguishable to the world around them. If you want to discover this truth, just... Have a walk down the streets of Hamilton tonight and take a look at how many churches are flying a rainbow-colored flag outside their front door. You know, it's easy for us to become anxious and to become despondent, even fearful, because the church often seems battered and bruised and weak. She often seems as if she's been backed into a corner She's against the ropes. It's the final round. She's being beaten. She's been marginalized by society. We we are not welcome in the public square. How can she remain firmly planted instead of being overwhelmed by a tide of opposition and sin? Now, if you're wondering about these things and now you're 
you're pricked in such a way that you're feeling a little bit of shame because these are thoughts that have come across your mind, I, I would encourage you with this fact that your questions and your anxieties are not new. Throughout history, many believers have struggled with these same questions. In fact, even great prophets and great apostles have struggled with these questions. And both our scripture readings illustrate this point in a compelling way. And in 1 Kings 19, we find the great prophet Elijah. You know, other than John the Baptist, who Jesus calls the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, I, I think Elijah would be a close second. Top three, anyway. The great prophet Elijah. He is fleeing for his life after wicked queen Jezebel has put a bounty on his head. Uh, years this man has ministered faithfully for the Lord. Years, decades. And suddenly Elijah wants to give up. His ministry hadn't appeared to bear any fruit. Can you imagine how frustrating that is? I think Jeremiah is another prophet. I don't think he ever sees a single convert in all the years he does his ministry. Elijah does not see a thriving, quote-unquote, church anywhere. The extinction of God's people is all but imminent. In 1 Kings 19, verse 14, we, we, we find this vivid picture of Elijah's despair. That even after God appears to him in the wind, well, not in the wind, and not in the earthquake, and not in the fire, but in this still, small voice, he repeats the same thing. Like, how low do you have to be as a believer that even this kind of display of omnipotence doesn't shake you out of your despondency? I have the ESV here. He says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, it's em emphasized in the Hebrew, I'm the only one left. And they seek my life to take it away. We could say that Elijah looks at the state of the church after years of faithful ministry, and he literally thinks that he is the last man standing on the face of this earth. The church isn't just one generation away from extinction, it's one guy away from extinction. And yet God is, is so gracious to Elijah in this moment. He had already told Elijah to ascend Mount Horeb. We didn't read that, but in the previous verses, he's directed to go to Mount Horeb. This isn't a random location by any means. It should have triggered something in Elijah he should have known his church history. Uh, maybe the name Horeb that doesn't ring any bells for you this evening. Its other name should. Mount Sinai. This is, this is Covenant Mountain that Elijah is directed to go to, to meet with God. This is the place where centuries earlier, after God had delivered the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, he brought them to Sinai, he married them, he enters into covenant with them, he promises to be their God, he promises that they will be his people, he promises that he will love them with this unstopping, always and forever love. This is where Elijah is standing. The cave that he's in, some scholars argue, is the same cleft in the rock that Moses is hidden in in Exodus as God's glory passes him and he proclaims his name for Moses. And so there's Elijah, despondent. But really, his despair is based on what he sees. His despair, maybe more accurately, is based on what he doesn't see or what he thinks he sees. And then in that moment, God reveals to Elijah that his ways are so much bigger than the way of humanity. His ways are so much bigger than what we see. His spirit can actually work inside of human hearts. Look at verse 18 if you have 1 Kings 19 in front of you. 
Here's Elijah, broken, depressed, burnt out, washed out. God says, uh, I'm going to replace you. Don't worry about it, pal. You go anoint Elisha. He'll take over. You're done. I'll send a chariot of fire. We read about it in the next book. Anoint these kings. They'll take care of business. But check out what I'm doing. Verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 in all of Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, admittedly, this isn't millions of believers. Doesn't seem all that impressive, does it? 7,000. But it's a faithful remnant. It's more than enough for God to continue his redemptive work in history. I mean, he starts it with one guy, Abraham. I mean, 7,000, that's a running start, isn't it? God's people were not at risk of going extinct. So that's 1 Kings 19. We turn to the book of Romans, and we find the Apostle Paul wrestling with a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar kind of issue. Here is Paul. He is an apostle to the Gentiles, but if you've read through the book of Acts, you know the paradigm of his ministry. He goes to the synagogue first, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. He writes like that in all his letters as well. And he's preaching the gospel, and the Gentiles are pouring in. It's awesome. But the Jews aren't. The Jews, his ethnic brothers and sisters, on the mass are rejecting Jesus. And he's all torn up about it. And, and it's understandable. If you look at Romans 9, if you have a Bible with you, uh, this is where there's this kind of digression. Romans 8 is this pinnacle, this summit in the book of Romans. Nothing will separate us from the love of God, there's no condemnation, and then we get this digression into the question of, well, what about Israel? In Romans chapter 9, Paul basically says, I'm paraphrasing, they had everything. The promises, the covenant, the promises, the human lineage of Jesus. I would go to hell if it meant they would believe. I would exchange places with my fellow brothers and sisters if it meant that they would embrace Jesus as Savior. That's how bad he wants it. Uh, if that doesn't speak to your heart this evening, uh, wake up. Do you have that same sort of empathy and compassion for the world around you, that you would go to hell so that your neighbor would come to know Jesus? And so he's wrestling through this question. And he's wondering if, God's purposes have failed, a little bit like Elijah. What is going on? And as we come to Romans 11, he's beginning to resolve this issue. And by grace, the Apostle Paul arrives at Mount Horeb again. This time it's figuratively. Because he references Elijah in 1 Kings 19. Look at verses 1 through 5. I ask then, has God rejected his people? And the answer is, well, by no means. Are you crazy? No. You know why? Because I'm an Israelite, he says. There may not be a lot of them coming in, but I am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what Scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Now, here's the point that I want you to take home tonight, if nothing else. We just read Lord's Day 21. We read Articles 27 and uh, 28 of the Belgian Confession. There will always be a church. Always. It may not always be in Canada, but there will always be a church. Think of what Jesus said. In Matthew 16, he's asking his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? And they give this 
list of different prophets. He's not interested in what they think. He says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter all of a sudden says, you are the Christ. And Jesus turns to him and says a few things, and then he says, on this rock, on this confession that Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell. A C.H. Spurgeon commenting on these verses, he said, he makes his rock-founded building into a stronghold against which the powers of evil lay continual siege, but all in vain, for the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what a, what a tremendous comfort and balm uh, for our anxieties about the future of the church. Uh, it's noteworthy, if you look at the Apostles' Creed, it's structured along Trinitarian lines. You may have noticed that, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when we're talking about the, the church, this is fitting into the work of the Holy Spirit especially. But when we profess our faith, in the Apostles' Creed, or, or through the Apostles' Creed, through the words, we say, I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to the church, it says we believe not in a holy Catholic church. We believe a holy Catholic church. The fact that we believe a church will always exist is an article of faith, not of sight. The gates of hell can do whatever they want. They can wipe the church out in North America, but we can always take the words of the Apostles' Creed onto our lips, and it will always be true, because Jesus said so. And we didn't read it earlier, but what would be a more appropriate response to this reality? The tail end of Romans 11, as Paul resolves this issue in his heart and in his mind, it ends on the perfect note. It ends on doxology. Romans 11, 33 through 36, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So the point here is when we do not fixate on the things that are seen on this earth, when we fix our minds on unseen realities where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father, then we are truly learning to walk by faith. The future of the church is in God's hands. It's not in Pastor Greg's hands or in my hands. It's in Jesus' hands. We do not believe in a holy Catholic church because we see it. We do not put our faith in the institution of the church because we see it. The Christian faith calls us to put our faith exclusively in the triune God. The existence of a holy Catholic church is dependent on who he is and on what he is doing and what he will do and what he promises he will do specifically in relation to the work of the Spirit. And that's the sense of Lord's Day 21 when it asks in, in question 54, what do you believe concerning the holy Catholic Christian church? And the answer is, well, I believe, even though I wasn't there, I believe that the Son of God out of the whole human race from the beginning of the world, Genesis to its end, Revelation 22 gathers, defends, preserves for himself by his spirit and word in the unity of true faith, a church chosen to everlasting life. And here's the best part. I believe that I am, and I forever shall remain a member of it. Now, the teaching of, of Article 27 in the Belgian Confession is similar. Uh, it makes reference to 1 Kings 19. And then it says that this holy church is preserved by God against the fury of the whole world. Although for a while it may look small and as extinct in the eyes of man. What a statement. If there's a quotable line in Article 27, the fury of the world, do your worst. 
The fury of the world is nothing compared to the God who speaks everything into existence. The church will continue to exist. Jesus provides words of assurance in his farewell discourse. In John 16, uh, verse 33, he says, I've said these things to you, that you may have peace in the world. You may have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. From this uh, profound assurance in John 16, we, we find John 17, obviously. Uh, and, and here Jesus is giving his high priestly prayer. And again, it, the church is on the mind of Jesus as he's about to go to the cross. Uh, he prays for unity in the church. He says, I don't ask for these only, but for those who believe in me through their word, that's you and me, that they may be one, just as you. Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So the church will always exist, whether we see it or not, and the church will always ultimately be one. There's only one bride of Christ. It will be one, spiritually speaking, despite uh, the multiplication of denominations and divisions and brokenness and schisms that we see in the world around us, that we see in just the evangelical landscape, there's one church. There's one bride. And so Article 27 continues, basically reiterating this point, that the church is not confined. Uh, it's not limited to one particular place or persons. It's spread. It's dispersed throughout the entire world, and yet it is joined and united with heart and will in one and the same spirit by the power of faith. So it's always there. It's one, and it's holy. Now, the holy character of the church isn't based necessarily on the blamelessness of the people in it. I'm sure you're all great people, but you're not always blameless. In fact, I bet you're a hypocrite half the time, and you're always sinning. We know our hearts. This is how we are. We, we know lots of Christians. The church is full. That's the best part. The church is full of struggling sinners, imperfect saints, and yet the church is called holy. It's called holy because the church is a people who have been set apart for God. Uh, the English word church is a translation of the Greek word ecclesia, which means to be called out of, to be separated from. Uh, the Apostle Peter speaks about this in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out, who churched you out of the darkness and brought you into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have. That's what makes the church holy. God makes the church holy. So what are the applications this evening? Well, one of them I've already mentioned. It's a call to faith. Uh, the church exists on the foundation of the promises of God, not on human effort. The church exists because Christ's spirit is at work in ways we do not always see. The church is one, despite what we see with our eyes. Another application is the way we speak about the church. She is the cherished and holy bride of Christ. And so as believers, we should speak about the church with deep affection and respect. But there's a final aspect, a final application in Article 28 that the Belgic Confession touches on, uh, and it's interesting how both Elijah and Paul demonstrate an understanding of this truth. Elijah thinks that the church is going to be extinct, but he does recognize that I'm part of it. I'm the only one left. Paul, same thing in Romans 11. I myself 
So the church isn't just this entity out there. It's something to which we all belong. And the final line of of answer 54 in, in the catechism brings this truth to a personal level. I believe that I am and forever shall remain a living member of it. And here's where we put teeth into that in Article 28. It's not enough to believe in Jesus and to keep your faith private and personal. Christianity is not a solo exercise. If we believe in Jesus Christ, then it follows that we believe there is a church. And if there is a church, the scriptures say that we are obliged to find it to seek it out wherever we can, to find where other believers are meeting together and join ourselves to them. How many people have you met? I've met lots of people like this who who claim to believe in Jesus, but they have no interest in participating in church. And according to the Bible, that's that's a contradiction in terms. That's like saying, well, I'm part of a soccer team. I'm part of a hockey team. I'm part of a volleyball team, but I never show up. Now, if that doesn't work in the sporting world, and to paraphrase Paul, how much more is that a problem in the church? And so we're called and obliged to join it and to serve in it for the benefit of others and to be blessed by others. And Article 28 says, we are called to submit to its instruction. And so we are privileged, we are blessed to be a people who have been called out of darkness. And the moment that God does this in Jesus Christ, he calls us to take our eyes off of ourselves, to focus on proclaiming his glory, his excellencies, and a close second is, or maybe it's the same thing, it's helping others, serving other believers, confessing a holy Catholic church is not an exercise in individualism or consumerism. It's a radical profession that I do not belong to myself. By grace, I belong to Jesus, and I belong to everyone else. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, we're grateful for the teaching of your word this evening that reminds us of how big you are, how magnificent your plans are and utterly mysterious to our human uh, ability to fathom and comprehend. We are so comforted to know that what our eyes see do not always reflect reality, Uh, that you are busy at work in corners of this globe that we have no idea about. You are busy at work in hearts in this city that we have no idea of what you are doing. Father, help us to trust this truth, and we pray that you would be gracious to us, and that in due time, you you would treat us like Elijah, that we would be able to come to meet some of these people that you have entered into relationship with through Jesus Christ. Father, help us to trust that Jesus is bigger than the fury of the world and the gates of hell, Help us to steward the gospel that we have been entrusted well. Help us to raise up our children. Help us to share the good news of Jesus Christ so that the church may grow and the lost may be saved. Father, help us to help each other as we walk this road and as we carry each other's burdens. We pray that as we do this, this local church here would become a refuge a resting place for the broken and the weary and the abused and those looking for hope. Father, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So we have an opportunity for a bit of q and A. I have one question that's come in, and I was also uh, notified, of course, with the streetlight guests that are with us this evening, that there's going to be maybe some questions that come from the floor. So hopefully it's not too crazy, but we'll give it a whirl. But the first question, just to lead us off, if you're thinking for a moment, uh, it seems like an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms, to have reformed uh, from the Catholic Church, yet profess that we believe in one holy Catholic Church. Uh, the world doesn't interpret the word Catholic to mean universal. Is this really the right word to use in our confession of faith? It's a good question. Uh, it's one that, uh, yeah, it's loaded with a lot of baggage for sure when we speak about the Catholic Church. Um, when you look at Article 27, it immediately defines it, that we believe one Catholic or uh, universal church. I don't think I would lose sleep if we only used the word universal. Uh, but just because the Roman Catholics use it doesn't mean they lay claim to it, uh, that they have a monopoly on the word too. Uh, I think it's, it's an old word. Uh, historically, I mean, it's, it's built into the Apostles' Creed as well. And so I think we align ourselves with the church of all times and places, the Catholic Church, uh, when we use it. And so then it maybe behooves us that we simply spend some time uh, just defining it for people and explaining what it actually means. And, and actually, that may be an opportunity for you to get into a discussion as to what the Catholic Church really is. Uh, it doesn't mean equal the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so that would be my answer to that. I don't have any other questions. Are there any uh, questions that are from the floor? Donna, yeah, go ahead. Yes. So Donna was just saying there are churches that don't follow the way. Uh, and the Bible talks about how there will be false prophets. Uh, that's a really good point. And um, so this sermon was the first in a series that I did in my church. And the next one that I did was how to identify whether a local church is really a faithful church. Uh, because that's a really, really great question. There are lots of churches that call themselves churches and say they follow Jesus. But if you walked in the doors, uh, you're not going to find the gospel of Jesus Christ there anywhere. Uh, you're only going to find false teaching. Um, yeah, so that's a really great point. So you can just come to redemption, and uh, we'll talk about that later. But thank you. That's okay. I'll come here and talk to you about it. Uh, any other questions from the floor? Everyone wants to go home. It's too warm. Well, I don't think I have any other questions. Going once. Oh, wait. Oh, here we go. Sorry, folks. Uh, would church and Israel be grafted with Israel at the end of the age? What does this mean for the church? Will church cease to exist? Ooh. The issue of church and Israel and the interplay there is a huge uh, theological landmine that you have just landed us on. Uh, Romans 11 is a hotly debated uh, topic. I think John Calvin, uh, N.T. Wright, when they speak about Israel and not all Israel being Israel, uh, they would say that the church today is the new Israel. It's the same thing. Uh, but there's lots of other uh, scholars, even in the Reformed camp. Uh, so they've been accused of being Zionists. Uh, but when you read through Romans 11, it, it is perplexing because what Paul writes at the very end here, basically he says, hey, Gentiles, just so you know, FYI, before you get all like up on yourselves, uh, the only reason you're being brought in right now is to make the Jewish people jealous. And at the end of history, there's going to be a massive conversion of ethnic Israel. And so that, that's what some scholars will argue. Before Christ returns in glory, we are going to see the ethnic people of Israel converted en masse to Jesus Christ. And really, when you read um, Romans, it's saying there's one olive shoot, and the Gentiles are the wild branch that's been grafted in. So there's only one people of God, um, Israel, church. Yeah, that, that's a big question. We can talk more about it. I failed my exegesis paper on that in seminary. 
And then Dr. DeVisser, or Visser changed his perspective and agreed with me after I graduated. And anyway, it's a sore point. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much for having me this evening. Allard's going to come and close us out. <laughs>